Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In next uh, couple of lectures, we are going to talk about a group of important endocrinopathy in children, that is hypothyroidism. What we are going to do is we are going to recall our knowledge of thyroid physiology and we'll try to understand the metabolism of thyroid hormones. What causes hypothyroidism in children? What are the causes of acquired hypothyroidism? Its epidemiology, its clinical features, how to investigate acquired hypothyroidism and the management of that. So we know that thyroid gland has two primary functions. One is the secretion of thyroid hormones, which are important for the maintenance of normal metabolism. And the other is secretion of calcitonin, which regulates the serum calcium levels. If we talk about the thyroid hormone synthesis, it is important for us to understand that iodine is one of the important raw material for thyroid hormone synthesis. The dietary iodide is absorbed through the intestine, goes via the circulation and reaches the thyroid glands, the thyrocytes. At the basolateral membrane, which is actually near to the capillary site, there is an important symporter which is called sodium iodide symporter. It transports two sodium ions and one iodide ions from the capillary site to the thyrocyte. And this is an energy dependent process which is facilitated by sodium potassium ATPase. There is another important transporter at the apical end of the thyrocyte which is chloride iodide exchanger, also called pendrin. This actually mediates transport of iodide out of the thyrocyte into the lumen where colite or thyroglobin is located. As soon as the iodide reaches the lumen, the apical membrane of the thyrocyte, it undergoes two-step process, which is called organification. First, it is oxidized to iodine. Next step is incorporation of iodine into the tyrosine residue of the thyroglobulin. There is another enzyme located at the apical area called the dual oxidase 2. This generates hydrogen peroxide which is utilized by thyroid peroxidase for the oxidation of iodide, iodine to iodine. Thyroid peroxidase also catalyzes incorporation of iodine into the tyrosine residue of the thyroglobin. The thyroid hormone so produced, they remain within the lumen as a part of thyroglobin molecule, the colloid, until they are needed. This colloid re represents the reserve of thyroid hormones, which can be used for the body requirements as and when needed up to two months. If we look at the synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormone closely, during the incorporation of iodine into the tyrosine residue of thyroglobulin, two important molecules are formed. One is 3 monoidotyrosine MIT, and the other is 3,5-diidotyrosine, DIT. Condensation of two molecules of DIT leads to the formation of tetraidotyronine. We commonly call it T4. And the condensation of one MIT with a DIT leads to triidotyronine, the T3. 
and if it is condensed in the reverse fashion it is called reverse t3 now these thyroid hormone when formed they are stored in the colloid as thyroglobulin whenever there is a need these thyroglobulin or colloid is internalized by the by endocytosis and by the lysosomal degradation within the thyrocyte they are converted to t4 t3 and reverse t3 and are secreted into the circulation and are taken through the blood to the areas where they have to exert their effect now in the circulation the free form of the thyroid hormones they are always in equi equilibrium with a much larger protein bound thyroid hormones these uh, protein bound thyroid hormones are very important because they represent a large pool which can be readily mobilized when and where needed this uh, protein bound hormones they actually also prevent the uptake of the hormone by the first cell that are come in contact with the thyroid hormone hence promotes uniform tissue distribution of thyroid hormones the proteins involved are the albumin thyroxin binding prealbumin and the thyroxin binding globulin now t3 is 3 to 5 times more potent than t4 it is the deiodination of t4 by enzymes called deiodinases into t3 which leads to the effect of the thyroid hormone now these hormones the d1 d2 d3 their activity varies among different tissues and at different physiological condition and period of the body for example the maximum activity of d iodinases is seen in the cerebral cortex in the pituitary gland where thyroid hormone is needed the most the reverse t3 generally is an inert hormone these hormone at the organ end they exert their physiological effects leading to for example tachycardia and increase muscular contractility by increase number of beta adrenergic receptors and enhance response to the circulating catecholamines the epinephrine and the norepinephrine and also by increased proportion of alpha myosin heavy chains these hormones are catabolic in nature stimulates lipolysis and breakdown of proteins they are very important for the osseous maturation and the skeletal growth very important in children where they would need this hormone for their growth also they are important for the neuro development they promote brain development so if these hormones are deficient during the initial part of the life where maximum brain development takes place one can imagine that there would be neuro developmental disability this also causes increased carbohydrate absorption through the gut and the formation of ldl receptors as would they produce calories by stimulating oxygen consumption and increase metabolic rate the other thing that one need to understand and realize is the negative feedback mechanism that causes the release or stoppage of synthesis and secretion of the thyroid hormone as we have just understood the t4 t3 are formed by the thyroid but this occurs under the influence of thyroid stimulating hormone secreted by the pituitary gland which in turn is released by the effect of thyroid propping releasing hormone secreted by the hypothalamus so whenever there is a deficiency of t3 t4 in the body signals from the hypothalamus 
as TRH stimulates the secretion of TSH, that in turn stimulates the thyroid hormone formation synthesis of the thyroid hormones and their secretion in the blood. If they are in sufficient quantity, there is a negative feedback stopping TRH and the TSH and the thyroid hormone synthesis. Now, hypothyroidism, as you would understand, is because of deficiency of the thyroid hormones, which can occur because of the defect at the thyroid gland level, the primary hypothyroidism, or as a result of reduced TSH stimulation, the secondary hypothyroidism, also called central hypothyroidism, or insufficient thyroid dropping releasing hormone level, by the hypothalamus, the tertiary hypothyroidism. Now, these can be both congenital and acquired. What we are going to talk today is the acquired hypothyroidism. But I want you to remember that congenital hypothyroidism is also very, very important. As a matter of fact, as we have discussed in the development of the brain, it is the thyroid hormone which plays a very important role. So we need understand and learn about the congenital hypothyroidism as well. So presentation of uh, acquired hypothyroidism can be as subtle as some um, changes uh, in the facies or presentation with a goiter or if severe and prolonged as a cretin, the condition we hardly see nowadays where they would be short, mentally retarded, with these coarse facial features and all that. The burden of the problem, 0.3% of school-age children are thought to be suffering from hypothyroidism. But remember that the subclinical hypothyroidism is much more common than that. Here, the clinical feature may not be apparent, but the TSH would be high and the T4 would be low as much as 2% of adolescents are thought to be suffering from subclinical hypothyroidism. So an adolescent having less energy to do stuff, not very eager to learn and, or has difficulty in learning, one might think of subclinical hypothyroidism. Females are, gender is more uh, likely to have hypothyroidism. Long list of causes, iodine deficiency, very common in our setup, leading to endemic goiter and hypothyroidism, autoimmune thyroiditis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, very, very common in Down syndrome and Turner syndrome, so has got a genetic link. So even without these syndromes, 20 to 30 percent of the cases would have family history of autoimmune thyroiditis. So a link of genetics generally has an insidious onset, would occur after the age of six years. The peak is around the adolescent. Again, females are more likely to have this sort of disorder. Hydrogenic hypothyroidism, large number of drugs. The one I want to mention are the anticonvulsant drugs we so often use in children. One need to be careful that these can lead to acquired hypothyroidism. Destruction of thyroid gland because of irradiation or radioiodine or surgery. There are other causes, involvement of other glands, type 1 and the type 2 polyglandular autoimmune syndrome. In type 1, there is hypoparathyroidism along with Addison disease and mucocutaneous candidiasis. And many of them would have hypothyroidism as well. Whereas in type two, there is Addison's disease, type one diabetes mellitus, and most of them would have hypothyroidism. Infiltrative disorders like cystinosis and histinosis and systemic disorders like nephrotic syndrome because of the loss of proteins, the thyroid Hormone binding proteins in the urine can lead to hypothyroidism. Rarer causes, central causes, leading problems with the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland, tumors like craniopharyngiomas, neurosurgery, cranial irradiation, 
and head trauma all can lead to acquired hypothyroidism like we have said manifestation can be many mostly subtle but one important thing that one need to remember is the deceleration of the growth they would tend to present with short stature and we have discussed that when we talked about short stature they may present just with a coiter weight gain constipation cold intolerance lack of energy apathy increased tendency to sleep cardiac effects as bradycardia also increased diastolic blood pressure secondary to increased systemic vascular resistance muscle weakness and cramps neurological manifestations maturation delay as far as the bone growth is concerned delayed puberty and in pubertal girls menstrual disturbances anemia which generally is normocytic but can also be macrocytic anemia they may also have hypocoagulable states and they tend to have increased ldh levels respiratory manifestations in the form of decreased exercise capacity or obstructive sleep apneas especially if they have got macroglossia at large tongue because of hypothyroidism they also tend to have pleural effusions and interestingly rhinitis as subtle a thing as rhinitis can be a manifestation of hypothyroidism of course dry coarse skin and the hair loss renal manifestation not only manifesting as uh, non pitting edema but also as hyponatremia and sometimes increased creatinine this is what the growth chart would look like growing normally as far as height is concerned insert over here in the form of whatever leading to hypothyroidism undetected for certain period of time detected over here and thyroxin started and you can see that after few years of straight line where there is no increase in height the height starts increasing again with the thyroxin therapy investigations are fairly simple we expect t4 and t3 to be low and as a result because they are low there would be negative feedback to the hypothalamus to the pituitary leading to increase in the tsh levels you might also want to do antibodies if you think it is autoimmune thyroiditis radiological investigations looking at the bone age by doing x rays of the wrist and the elbow joint and looking at the consistency of the thyroid gland by the ultrasound of course in certain case, cases you would like to do certain radioactive isotope scans as well so how to reach to conclusion of primary and secondary hypothyroidism if free t4 is low but tsh is elevated this is a case of primary hypothyroidism however if both are low this would suggest central cause either secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism so if it is primary hypothyroidism there is a delay in the bone age they would present with short stature because fall off they would fall off in the linear growth and in other cases where it would be more abrupt more subacute you want to do antibody levels to look for autoimmune thyroiditis when both are low either the secondary or the tertiary here you want to differentiate between the problem at the level of hypothalamus or at the level of the pituitary gland you would do trh stimulation test so trh stimulation increases the tsh response suggest that the problem is at the level of pituitary yeah, well if it increases it is at the level of hypothalamus and this is tertiary hypothyroidism if with trh stimulation there is no response in the tsh this is secondary hypothyroidism and the problem is at the level of the pituitary management uh, the goal is to normalize the tsh and to maintain the t4 and the free t4 in the upper half of the reference range we want to keep it little higher upper half this is important for us to understand and 
the drug, the wonder drug, the only drug is thyroxine. Doses are written over there. Now, the other important thing that I want you to understand is that acquired hypothyroidism, you start the therapy, there would not be neurodevelopmental sequelae. If you do it promptly, they would reverse. The neurodevelopmental problems would reverse. This is in contrast to the congenital hypothyroidism where the neurodevelopmental sequelae would not reverse. So it would be very appropriate and important to start therapy promptly in congenital cases as compared to the acquired cases. So the T4 would normalize in one week's time and the TSH would normalize in a couple of weeks. You would like to repeat the labs within a week's time after start the therapy, then after every two weeks with any dose change, and then every four to six months, depending upon the underlying condition. Prognosis is uh, untreated cases. You can understand short stature, puberty problems, psychosocial issues, scratching precocious puberty is something very interesting that we are going to discuss when we are going to talk about precocious puberty in children with prompt treatment, the outcome is excellent. However, late diagnosis would have substantial impact on the cognition and the behavior of the children. To sum up, children can have congenital as well as acquired hypothyroidism, problem at the level of thyroid gland or at the level of pituitary or at the level of Hypothalamus all can lead to acquired hypothyroidism. Causes are varied. Manifestations are related with the physiological effects of the thyroid hormone. Diagnosis is fairly simple, but we need to interpret closely the, the relation between the T4 and the TSH. Thyroxine, the wonder drug, leads to favorable prognosis if you start it appropriately. Uh, sometime you end up with a lifelong management. With that, we we'll stop. If there are any questions and comments, we're more than happy to take them. Thank you very much.